Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Kerwin and on today's episode I have Amy Proal. Amy graduated from Georgetown University with a degree in biology. She then obtained her PhD in microbiology from Murdoch University in Australia. Following on from that, she became a member of the research team at the Autoimmunity Research Foundation. She has also authored research papers that examine the role of the human microbiome and virome in chronic inflammatory disease, plus written book chapters on the subject and lectured on it at the National Institutes of Health and conferences. Amy, thank you so much for coming on for the, to the show today. Gary, thanks. It's my pleasure. So... Um, yeah, yeah I, I try to do a little bit of digging because I went down a little rabbit hole myself recently with the microbiome and your name cool. popped up. And so, of course, I had to watch some of your videos and read some of your articles. And I thought, wow, I've got to get Amy on because the things that she's sharing <laughs> are really interesting. So Good. before we get down into the the, the juicy parts, um, you're my first guest where we're exploring the microbiome. So just to set the stage, um, the words that I used earlier, could you just give p- listeners a um, what the definition of the microbiome and the virome is. Yeah, well, okay. So it's a it's not complicated, but it's certainly an extensive thing. But in, in simple terms, I would refer to the microbiome as all the microbes in the human body. Um, and those include bacteria, viruses, fungi, and even other microbes like archaea, which are similar to bacteria, but a little bit different. So it's... it's um, an eco, the ecosystems of microbes that inhabit the human body. And by doing that, they and the metabolites and proteins that they express and create as part of their lifestyles um, interact with our own. They also interact with our own biology. So in a sense, the microbiome adds to who, what we are as humans. We, are, we have these microbial ecosystems that now we understand um, persist not just in the gut, but in many other parts of human tissue and blood. So that would be the, a simple explanation of the human microbiome. If you want to take it a little more technical, um, the definition also includes the genes of all those microbes, which are the, the genetic material of those microbes. It's the, the communities and their genes and how they act and influence us. And what you just mentioned there already is what's fascinating because what you know, the conversations I always hear about the microbiome is the gut microbiome. Or recently I had a guest on a dentist who was talking about um, the the, yeah. den- the mouth microbiome. But, you know, mm-hmm. so I guess in people's minds listening, they always think, oh, it's just the bugs, the healthy bugs or potentially the bad bugs that are inside mm-hmm. my gut that help keep me healthy. But as you mentioned, we're talking about the whole body here so that these things are mm-hmm. even outside of the gut. Yeah, so it depends. Um, the gut microbiome is by far the best uh, micro, best studied microbiome community because that's where the microbiome microbiome research started. So the the gut, um, obviously, we've always kind of accepted that the gut had some mi- microbes in it. We knew that 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 microbes were involved with digestion. So around the year two thousand ish, right? Um, there was a change in the way that a lot of research teams began to study microbes in the human body. And that was that teams went from culturing microbes in what would be a petri dish picture in a lab, you know, like a scientist in a white coat and they're culturing microbes, which is still still a great way to look for microbes. Don't get me wrong. That's what we've been doing for most of the century. But at that time, because of some of the technology that was being developed to study the human genome or the the genes that make us human, um, some people began to turn that technology into tools that could also help identify microbes and viruses in the body based on their genomic material, their DNA and their RNA, like their genomic signatures. So what that meant is we could use these novel computer-based tools to look for microbes in the human body. And that really changed the game because around 2000-ish, when a couple teams started using those tools, they were able to identify more microbes than we thought, than we could identify by culture. We just simply could find more of them, and we could also just better understand exactly where they were um, and a bit more about the ecosystem in general, right? So that was really important in helping us even realize that there was a gut microbiome. And so early research began on the gut microbiome. Part of it is also because fecal samples, which are how a, a main way, which, you know, fecal material, 
that's where you most people, let's look at most groups analyze in order to study the gut microbiome. You can take that fecal sample and that sample will contain a lot of the microbes that are in the gut. And so you can take that, use these computer tools to analyze the microbes and viruses in the sample, and you can kind of come up with what's going on, right? So that's e actually easy, cheap way to do stuff. Now, when it comes to other human tissue and blood, you can see how that would get uh, a lot harder. The blood not being quite as hard, but of course, like let's say we want to study microbes in the brain. Well, we have to get autopsy brains and the tools have to get a lot more complicated. So it was a natural beginning to look at microbes in the gut. So that's where we started looking at the microbiome. But in the last, I would say, five-ish years, there's been an explosion of research on microbiome ecosystems and other body sites. And these are body sites that have conventionally or forever been thought to be sterile, right? So this is definitely a paradigm shift. Um, right now, and I, you can see there's Right now, medicine and science are still adjusting this paradigm shift because in medical school, um, there are still a decent number of medical schools that teach that the human body is largely sterile and that, for example, the brain is an immunoprivileged organ. And that's based on an understanding over the past century. But now these new analyses that are beginning to look at these tissues with these new computer-based tools are finding that these tissues do not at all appear to be sterile. That's a major game changer and it honestly it impacts pretty much most of how we look at health and disease. Because if there are microbes and tissues that we thought to be sterile, what they're doing, their activity, the cells that they infect, their metabolism all begins to interact with ours. And it helps us much, it actually, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It, helps, it gives us so much more knowledge of what, what's actually going on. So yeah, so for example, we now know there's a bladder microbiome. I think that one's interesting because the bladder has been conventionally regarded as absolutely sterile. Um, and there is a placental microbiome. That one's pretty interesting to think about it. So an infant in the womb is actually incubated for nine months with a microbiome that's in the placenta. And that microbiome, and there's, a, just a, there's a couple of studies right now, but there's bacteria, viruses, fungi already in those communities. So that's seeding the infant for, for nine months. And those microbes come from the mother, right? Obviously. The mother's microbes are what creates the placental microbiome, which is then seeding the infant. So that actually uh, sort of, or adds to the fact that microbes are inherited in many ways. So illnesses or whatever, uh, predispositions for certain conditions, things tied to infection and microbiome are actually passed in a large way from mother to child, which is a whole, opens up in a lot of new avenues as well. I mean, there's a breast milk microbiome, which I think is fascinating. So they, see, these are new ways of looking at old questions. So you say, why is formula different than breast milk? Well, my most interesting thing is now we realize there is a diverse and pretty extensive microbiome in human breast milk. And that obviously, again, many babies, you know, breastfeed for up to two years. So that is contributing to seeding the entire gut um, infants microbiome communities, especially their gut. So if a baby's formula fed, well, what does that mean? We don't know yet, but there are certainly going to be implications. I mean, already yeah. what you're just sharing here, I'm sure people are like, <laughs> what? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fascinating, right? Yeah. I know. I mean, I'm so when I when I studied um, physiology and and did my my biology studies, I mean, nowhere near the level of you, but real basic stuff. It was. I was always told, you know, the brain, for example, is a sterile environment. That's why if you get like meningitis, is a big problem because now right. infection has crossed in and. And there's there's right. pro there's problems here, but you're saying, you know, we've got yeah. these little things that are that are there potentially in all healthy people, but they don't have to cause problems. But yeah, it's in all right. these other systems, and it's just fascinating to think, as you mentioned with the the breast milk or with the mm -hmm. placenta. I mean, that's mind blowing. I'm just already <laughs> thinking, yeah. crikey, that's fascinating. When we're talking about the mother's health affecting the baby, mm -hmm. like so, the mother's okay. microbial influence over the child already and how that's influencing their growth patterns and who knows whatever right. else because for example there was a study which showed that the breast milk microbiome composition bacterial composition of obese weight mothers was less diverse and different than that of healthy weight mothers so for example the mother's health if you want you know the mother's whatever uh, can affect the composition of the microbiome that is passed to the infant. So that, that's an example, but it's something that I think we, we definitely need to keep in mind, these patterns. And when you're talking about the brain, um, I, I have to say that the brain microbiome is one of the most interesting. Now, this is really preliminary. <laughs> um, for a long time, we've known 
if you look at the literature over the past century, even a lot of teams have identified microbes in the brain here and there. But again, it's a little bit more like you were taught that these microbes are there under very specific conditions of infection or they're dri- they have to be there because they're driving a disease. Um, the idea that microbes might also simply persist in communities in the brain, but not always be driving symptoms is, is pretty much still uh, not very well accepted. However, right now, um, I'm not actually, I, I live in Los Angeles, but I'm in Boston by Harvard. And that's one of the reasons is because I, ju- I had a fascinating meeting with um, a team at Harvard led by Rudy Tanzi and Robert Moir, and they're doing what's called the Brain Microbiome Project. And it is so fascinating. They, um, they study Alzheimer's disease, right? And so they haven't yet published the data, which is um, you know, unfortunate because when their data is published, I think it's going to be really interesting. But they have allowed me to say that there really is evidence that there is a brain microbiome, early evidence of a brain microbiome. So we're talking bacterial communities that would be in almost every person, right? And in disease, the key, like the gut, in disease, we might find, and this is what they're finding very preliminarily, I have to say, in Alzheimer's, they still have to publish a lot of the results, but still, they find it's not just maybe single microbes that, that could be changing in Alzheimer's if there's a, if there's a contribution from pathogens. It might actually be the community, uh, community shift, like an ecosystem shift. And so they have been studying one of the reasons, um, and I think this is really cool, is that the reason they started doing the brain microbiome project is because as we're all familiar with, there's a lot of neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's, inflammation in the brain. Now, normally if you find inflammation in a condition, it's a kind of, it's a clue that infection could be, could be part of it or, or microbes could be involved because inflammation is the immune system's response to an infectious agent. Of course, if we don't know there are infectious agents, we'll just think that inflammation is, you know, occurring due to self attack or something like that, right? But it changes the game. If there's some infectious agents in the area, the inflammation might be generated in response to them. So they and a couple other research teams studying Alzheimer's are now looking at basically a paradigm shift in Alzheimer's where they began to look for microbes in the brain. One team identified many, a, a range of viruses in the Alzheimer's brain. And they, they looked at HHV6, for example, just a, a well-known virus. But when HHV6 can persist in brain tissue in these patients with Alzheimer's, there they did a number of analysis that showed it was capable of altering human gene expression in ways that drove the neuroinflammation and drove neuron loss. So you can see that it's, it, it changes the game in the sense that it's not just even about what microbes you have, it's about where they are and what they're doing where in the locations where they are. So I think we're looking at a new paradigm in which we'll find that no part of the body is sterile at all. And we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to account for that. Yeah. And again, this is why I've got you on because what you're just sharing again just blew my it's mind when really I was reading awesome. it. And now yeah. you're just blowing it even more just with what you're saying. And you can find there's a couple other really uh, cool research teams that have found bacterial communities in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. These are published studies, fungal communities in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. So it's really because the last 403 drug trials on Alzheimer's disease have failed. And I think that this is a new uh, avenue then for the fact that maybe we could take into account the fact that there might be pathogens and microbes affecting the condition. Because I'll add in one more thing that's fascinating. This is again Harvard research. So what they, the same team, Robert Marr and Rudy Tansy found is that we all know in, in Alzheimer's, um, the brain creates plaque, right? That's known, thought to be the driver of the disease, these amyloid beta plaques. Well, what they found over the last couple of years is those are actually antimicrobial peptides. They're actually, the plaque is not plaque. They're natural antibiotics created by the immune system to target microbes. So what we're looking at when the plaque forms is an antimicrobial response to what it seems to be microbes in the brain. So this is a total paradigm shift for Alzheimer's. And if you want, I can send you some of these studies, but this is Harvard (laughs) research. And they actually... They, can, they have studies showing that these plaques form in response to different bacteria, different viruses, all kinds of things. So what we're looking at is a situation in which the body's less sterile and a lot of the parts of the body that we were assumed to be useless byproduct, like plaque or even arterial plaque, we now realize may actually be more of part of... The arterial plaque is not yet, has not yet been shown to be that way in a study. I could go into that differently. More like these brain plaques are actually part of an immune response rather than just being a useless molecule that accumulates in the brain. And so 
the last 403 drug trials, trials on Alzheimer's attempted to remove that plaque. And now the current thinking is, wait a second, what if that plaque has a function? What if there's a reason the plaque is generated that we missed? That's really exciting. Yeah, that is. That's, again, wow. <laughs> that's all I can say at the moment. <laughs> it's all new information to me on this one too. Um, so, I mean, hopefully people listening to this are, are as excited as I am just with this, this this information that's just coming to light now, thinking, wow, okay, so we aren't this sterile thing that we are living with a bunch of whole other things in our body and it's that diversity and that ecosystem in mm -hmm. all parts of our body that um, I guess promotes good health. Um, so you, as you've touched on slightly, it's about the, even a different way of thinking about autoimmunity. Do you want to mm -hmm. sort of take us into that thought process of how all these new discoveries might change the way that we, we look at autoimmune diseases? Right, definitely. Because I think it's a, it's a major consideration that we need to look at right now. The theory of autoimmunity, um, which most of us are familiar with, which is in simple terms, the idea that in patients with conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or multiple sclerosis, something goes wrong, the immune system fails and begins to attack itself. There are a number of theories that have been created for why this would happen, but none of them have you know, really been proven to be true. I, we, it's a, it's actually doesn't necessarily even make sense in it from an evolutionary perspective that people continue to reproduce who have these faulty immune systems that just one day decide to attack themselves. So a, a lot of patients, I think, and, and even uh, integrated practitioners have always thought that that was never, never fully made sense as a model, but it certainly became the mainstream model for these conditions, right? And so what that led to was the development of a range of immunosuppressive drugs. And they're the top selling drugs in the world, Humira, um, prednisone, I mean, steroids, because if that's the case, and you think that in these conditions, the immune system is attacking itself, then the treatment would be to shut down the immune system and stop it from firing. Um, but while we've been doing that over the last couple decades, autoimmune disease has not been doing well. The, the rate uh, or incidence of almost every autoimmune condition is on the rise. And also patients relapse on these drugs continually. If you talk to patients, I mean, they need, they'll start with an immunosuppressant, then a couple of years later, they need higher doses of that. Or they come in and they have a second autoimmune condition in addition to that one, and they have to take stronger doses. These are not treatments that really appear to be getting at the root cause of the illness. And what could, what could definitely be part of that is if the body is not sterile and there are microbiome, microbe ecosystems in different parts of the body. What's important to understand about the microbiome is that there's a whole range of different microbes in these ecosystems. It's like a forest. There are animals that can act in many different ways. So um, think of a forest. In, in under condition of health, let's say, or when the environment's fine in a forest, that uh, you know, this animal is eating that animal, and that animal eats this animal, and that means that these trees grow because it, there's these complex relationships between the animals. And when, the, when that ecosystem is in a state of balance, things go okay. Now, it's the same general concept with human microbiome ecosystems. These ecosystems seem to persist with us, and if the immune response is all right or things, they, they're okay. But there are potential pathogens in all of these microbiome communities, microbes that can act as pathogens if the immune system kind of gets knocked down or just what, uh, depending on conditions, right? So what actually happens is now there's, as we begin to realize there's more of a microbiome in the body, research communities are tying imbalances of these microbial ecosystems to these autoimmune diseases. So what that means is that the inflammation generated in autoimmune disease may not be against self. It may actually be generated in response to parts of these microbiome ecosystems that are moving away from a state of balance and beginning to favor the survival of pathogens that act in ways that actually promote disease. So that would be a game changer. If that's the case, then we would not actually want to suppress the immune system anymore. We would actually want to consider um, supporting the immune system so that it could better target these pathogens that might be actually at the root of these conditions. And that's one of the biggest things that I have tried to study and work on in my career, which would be, um, do we need to reevaluate autoimmune B and the fear of autoimmune B? And yeah, I just published a paper and I, I still think the answer is absolutely yes. 
Um, now there are so many, so many microbes in the human body. It is far more likely that the immune system is responding to them than to self. So that is, um, it's, it's a paradigm shift and it's, I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's one of the, the biggest considerations medicine needs to take into account right now, because we have this idea, if we continue to run on this idea that the immune system just breaks down in response to nothing, um, that isn't actually up to date anymore with what's actually happening in the body. So that's the key takeaway here for people yeah. listening is that we've had this idea that it just triggers off. Um, it could be right. genetics. It could be something that we, we're just not quite sure, but suddenly right. this person just gets all these symptoms. Like you said, rheumatoid arthritis, their right. joints flare up and they get all sore. Mm -hmm. So then we give them drugs to just dampen that response and right. then try control it. But mm -hmm. The thinking now with all these discoveries is that no, actually there could be these other things, these microbes, these pathogens that kick off the inflammatory process, yeah. and by accident and sustain it too. Like yeah. they, they, because not even just trigger, like remain persisting and kind of sustain a chronic inflammatory response towards their presence. Yeah. And and so like in this situation, then people might go, is so is this my gut biome, microbiome, or is it? um the the brain one now is it I'm, I'm guessing this is gonna this is opening up the cascade of questions because where is this mic you know where is this pathogen yeah. in which microbiome that kicked off this whole cascade that this person is now dealing with because you know right. pe i guess the reason people will be asking this is to go so wh which area of my body do i need to treat to like yeah. rebalance my microbiome is it my bladder i need to fix is it my gut right. is it my that, what yeah that's a logical question and so i think um it depends on the condition. Uh, so for example, Crohn's disease is an excellent example of a condition that is still labeled autoimmune and still treated with immunosuppressants aggressively um, by you know, your av the average physician, but is also tied now in, I would say, hundreds of studies to what's called dysbiosis or imbalance of the gut microbiome. So this is one of the conditions that we first began to tie towards the microbiome um, autoimmune that's microbiome based again, because the gut is the easiest location to study in the body when it comes to the microbiome. And so Crohn's disease. Now, I think there's even an under, I think that understanding is even reaching most, uh, scientists and physicians. Now, this is actually a microbiome driven disorder in a large extent. The, the, the organisms in the gut, um, move away from a state of balance. You'll see bacterial pathogens emerge and cause inflammation. Sometimes viral pathogens emerge and cause inflammation. The nature, the exact nature of the imbalance can, can vary from person to person, but the outcome, which is inflammatory symptoms, you know, a number of really debilitating inflammatory symptoms in the gut is a sim similar outcome, right? So there's a big move in Crohn's then to say, wait, hold, maybe let me not, you know, the immunosuppressants, and I'm going to say that sometimes people have to take them because we've created an atmosphere now where people need to function and immunosuppressants do knock down symptoms and allow you to function. So if you have to go to work the next day, you might have to take an immunosuppressant to knock down your symptoms, right? And I'm not trying to criticize people who do that. Or The goal though is like long-term, if we try to develop therapies that better target the actual root of this, what would we do? An increasing number of people in Crohn's are saying, no, let's try to use probiotics. Let's do, there's fecal microbiome transplants are a big thing with Crohn's, right? Um, or ulcerative colitis, IBS, or forms of IBS. You know, do you know what those are? Fecal mm. microbiome transplants. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, again, like taking fecal material from a different person sounds kind of gross, but you know, patients more than happy to do this and it would improve their symptoms. And then sort of enemying that material into your own gut to try to switch up. Essentially, just it would be like bringing a whole new batch of animals into into a forest right to try to say like look if we bring in these new organisms maybe they're functioning better let's see if i can do that that's kind of the goal of a fecal transplant and data from that does show that patients do seem to improve somewhat with these conditions with that so that's a good clue that yeah switching up the microbiome and trying to improve composition of the microbiome can make a big difference in this autoimmune condition which i don't think the inflammation is generated i think the inflammation is generated in response to the microbes I mean, so in that case it's more clear crohn's disease we'd be looking at the gut microbiome mostly right uh, ib those kind of conditions now in conditions like arthritis um or lupus those are still conditions where we just, in my opinion, we need to explore the microbiome even more. Um, there's preliminary studies that have looked at um, composition of the microbiome and other body sites in those conditions, but not that much. The interesting part is the whole, a whole other aspect of research related to the microbiome 
has to do with what's called the gut brain axis. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, no about it. Yeah, but you can explain so it to people. The gut brain axis. So even if there are microbes in the gut, there are uh, nerves that connect and pathways, neuro, neurological pathways and nerves, like the vagus nerve is one of the primary nerves. You'll, you'll hear that nerve mentioned a lot, connects the brain to the gut. So what that means is that um, gut microbes can signal um, through these nerves in ways that affect the immune response in the brain. And it appears from early research that um, either the immune cells are, are possibly microbes in the brain can signal back to the gut via this axis. So there's a lot of interesting research in conditions like autism or um, even in rheumatoid arthritis, some of the autoimmune conditions that have just looked at that. They've looked at signaling through this axis and seen that in patients with pretty much almost any chronic inflammatory condition now, you'll see that there seems to be an uh, imbalance of the gut microbiome and that signaling through that axis might be affected in ways that can, what that means is that just imbalance of the gut microbiome alone can influence symptoms in the brain and almost the rest of the body. So what that, what that paradoxically shows is that symptoms outside the gut could still be influenced by microbes in the gut. So you have to take that into consideration. So maybe you have um, you know, inflammation somewhere out, outside the gut that could still be due to signaling that might be impaired through the gut-brain axis. Now, in my opinion, well, we need to take, and there are certain teams that do this, a closer look at just microbes in tissue and blood. Um, microbes that persist inside the cells of the immune system are some of the biggest drivers of disease because any pathogen that can persist, think about it, inside a human immune cell or inside a human cell can create a huge amount of dysfunction. It can actually, the metabolites and proteins it creates can get in the way of the ability of the cell to, to do its own jobs. Um, the, there's a pathogen and all its stuff in there. So it, it will can disrupt the, the way the cell can um, express and translate its own DNA. So it, an intracellular pathogen can really disrupt the body's gene expression and metabolic pathways. And so I think that we'll see, uh, we see early uh, research on that and we'll see increased research on that in conditions um, in which microbes in the blood um, or other tissues are acting through pathways like that to influence conditions with symptoms across the body. Right now, though, if you were just looking at uh, what you could, interventions, what you could do today, um, I would say trying to improve gut microbiome health is probably not going to hurt you. I don't really see that there's a way that, I mean, I, I don't know because I, there, there are certain probiotics. I, like, for example, there's a probiotic VSL3 that I think I've seen a decent number of people use. It seems to help stuff. I definitely agree with people who are experimenting more with eating fermented foods that contain microbes, things like that. Definitely the, a lower carb, lower sugar diet seems to make sense to me sometimes in the sense that um, glucose and sugar can often uh, feed uh, bacteria that are not uh, desirable in the microbiome. I, I don't have a firm opinion on any of that. Um, but I think that those are all trends that are worth looking at, exploring. And there are a lot of people tinkering with that right now. And I think that, that I say, go for it. I say, we really, and there are a lot of biotech companies looking into that too right now, which is really cool. How can we tinker with the gut microbiome in ways that um, might improve the stability of the gut microbiome? Because you can see that could have flow on effects. If you improve the gut microbiome composition, you might even improve signaling through the gut brain axis that might, infect, you know, that might flow on to a, a better immune response, which would then make it harder for pathogens in blood to, you know, so there's certainly flow on effects from improving gut microbiome uh, dysbiosis that could probably be beneficial to the whole body. That being said, I would love to see more interventions. Um, I would love to see the scientific community develop more um, antiviral medications. More, and I mean, I would like to see a more focus on. Um, there, there are a couple. There are a range, for example, of supplements that break up what are called biofilms, which is a different topic. There are bacterial communities, complex communities of bacteria that form together in order to better protect themselves from the immune system. And so that's actually um, been recognized in a lot of conditions, especially some of the GI conditions, but biofilm can form in a lot of, in any microbiome community pretty much. And so I see uh, there are a number of biofilm busting supplements. And, you know, I think that's a pretty good idea actually also, because bi once microbes are in a biofilm, I can pretty much tell you they're probably not working for your benefit. They're probably surviving for their benefit. So that kind of thing. But um, 
my overall, what I would like to see, and I think this is, it's another paradigm shift and that's why it's difficult is that it goes back to what I was talking about with autoimmunity. It goes back to what I've been talking about is I would like to see medicine explore supporting the immune system rather than knocking it down all the time. I would like to see if we could develop almost preventative treatments that allow the immune system to remain in a more stable place that actually help people um, help the immune system better keep um, what you could say microbiome dysbiosis in check before it even really happens or treatments that um, actually use our own natural immune defenses to better help us um, defend ourselves against pathogens or even toxic environmental exposures that might be affecting us. And so, for example, today, (laughs) I'll just give an example. The Nobel Prize was awarded today to two researchers who's developed what's called cancer immunotherapy. Are you familiar with that? Not cancer immunotherapy, no. So I think this, I was excited about that prize today. Um, And what it is, is in cancer for a long time, um, we've been using chemotherapy, obviously, and treatments that in a way, it's similar to autoimmunity. Treatments that in, in simple terms, they try to kill the body and the cancer and see which who wins out. That's, that's my basic description of chemo. Um, and all right, but immunotherapy is a new way of looking at cancer treatment. Researchers decided to try to activate a patient's own T cells. And T cells are a really important component of the immune response uh, against pathogens and infections, to be honest. And what happens is they will they activate a patient's T cells. It takes a lot of, they, they do it specifically for each patient. This is very new, but the, the outcomes have been impressive. And then the patient will actually deal with what, what's called um, cytokine storm syndrome. It's almost like a Herxheimer response. Do you know what I mean by Herxheimer? That horrible detox feeling. Yes, they actually go through that, which is interesting. And that's, it's, it's called cytokine release syndrome. They feel worse for a while and sometimes really much worse. But if these patients endure that reaction for a while, they end up reaching a state of remission that is just vastly more impressive than, than chemotherapy. And these are early studies again, but we've, I've seen studies with 40% of patients going into remission, 50%, as opposed to chemo studies that can sometimes say like 1% of patients went into remission. We're talking about remission too, not even just, man. well, I mean, we need more long-term data. But so what that means is, if we might have to take that step to activate the immune system against what could be dysregulation in the body. But if we are willing to let the immune system and, you know, whatever it is, tumor stuff, fight it out, we might actually reach an outcome in which the patient's long-term health improves. I'm really interested in that trend. And what's interesting is at the same time that this immunotherapy is being trialed and used more, research on the tumor microbiome is also exploding. So there are a number Pretty much every tumor that has actually been tested has its own microbiome in it. It's now, if you look in breast cancer, there's the breast cancer tumor microbiome. You can look up those studies. Colon cancer tumor microbiome. Just read a study in pancreatic cancer. You can actually see the micro communities. There's a couple studies where you can see them change over time in ways that promote the tumor formation and suppress genes that would um, otherwise make it more difficult to the tumor to not form. So infection and pathogens are directly involved in the pathogenesis of cancer. So when we activate these T cells, we're probably actually targeting a number of pathogens in the tumor. That results in the kind of a Herxheimer type reaction, but the patient seems to do better in the long term. That's what I think we should explore. That goes back to what, got, what I did um, my earliest research was actually trialing a treatment that became known as the Marshall Protocol in patients with autoimmune disease. We tried to do the same thing. We used a a, a medication that activated part of the innate immune response in patients. Um, And we tried to see if over time, while patients dealt with a Herxheimer response, if they improved. And we actually have a number, a decent number of case histories from patients who did really well on that. And I have two published papers on that um, that I could send you later. So it's really cool case histories. So, you know, that, that kind of treatment should be looked into more, which would be, it's a paradigm shift. Instead of seeing our immune systems as sort of against us, we could actually look at our immune systems as our friend and say, how can we get our immune systems to better help us? That is what I think um, medicine could really do, especially now that we know there are so many microbes and pathogens that you know, the immune system needs to address.
Yeah. And I mean, what you're saying here is all about that innate system, you know, the inborn system Mm -hmm. that the body wants to heal itself. And that is fascinating that we we could potentially supply drugs to boost that system, you know, to try to stimulate it Um, for severe cases, like even cancers, like uh, terminal Mm -hmm. cancers, typically, um, just to say, hey, body, hopefully you can go in and just deal with this. Because, you know, the biggest thing, people are probably just still sitting there listening with their earbuds and thinking, oh, my goodness, this is just like mind blowing, this overload. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, in a good way. And, you know, the, one of the big things I'm getting here, Amy, is is just the complexity, just realizing, you know what, we think we figured it out, but there's a bajillion different interactions happening all over the place. Um, it is that. And, and so, in a way, it's like, should we... L- instead of trying to isolate the one single factor, actually, we may never ever sort that because there is no one single factor. It's a exactly. family of a cascade of events. So how yep. could how could we nurture that cascade mm-hmm. to to deal That's with exactly it? Exactly right. That the last one, what I think has impeded, I think there's always been a huge, there's been a many researchers over the past centuries that have looked at the role of infection and chronic inflammatory disease. But they studied single pathogens. So they would look at Epstein-Barr virus alone. And that's interesting. They actually found a lot of cool find- Epstein-Barr virus can drive a lot of symptoms, but persistent symptoms even. But now that we understand that these microbes persist as part of communities, that previous research was a little like studying bears in a forest without understanding, you know, what the other animals around the bears were doing or what the bear, you know, so, so now we have this new understanding of being able to study organisms within the communities in which they actually persist and live in. And what we, what we realize is that these, these, any pathogen or any microbe is constantly interacting with its neighbors. And so this does add to the complexity, but it also opens doors for better understanding what's going on. So for example, there's some papers, um, this one group, uh, I love Herbert Virgin, uh, University of Washington. He studies what are called trans kingdom viral interactions. And so, uh, yeah, enough. Kingdoms, to, I know trans. it sounds crazy, but it actually shows how viruses will interact with bacteria and the way the bacteria is acting affects the virus's activity. And sometimes fungi get in on that and change their gene expression so that they act differently. So what we're really looking at, yeah, is sometimes if we only had looked look at one organism alone, we may not understand the patterns that are causing it to act and do what it's doing, right? And so I think understanding that there's a human microbiome is, is one of the biggest breakthroughs in all of human medicine and science because we can now understand, we can study these organisms as members of complex communities, right? Now, I'll just add, and it's also a little mind-blowing, but because um, I never fully explained the virome to you, mm-hmm. um, this also, I think, is going to be very important. It's also early research. Um, but now um, these new molecular tools have been turned more onto looking at viruses in the human body. And I'll just clarify, most of the early microbiome studies, and still, there's a focus on bacteria because that was those were the first organisms we looked for. Lately, a couple of teams are like, let's look harder for viruses. And it's, it's, just, it's just crazy because when they started looking, they're finding so many. And what is interesting about, so the virome refers to the viral ecosystems in the human body. And of course, they interact with the bacterial ones constantly. But if you just want to talk about the viruses, you refer to it as the virome. So what's interesting is that in these viral communities, there are viruses that are called bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria and modulate how bacteria act, right? So those are key players in any microbiome ecosystem because right now we've been studying the bacteria and trying to understand what the bacteria are doing. But what if, and or almost certainly, the fact that their activity is constantly modulated by the viruses that infect them has a tremendous impact on their behavior. In the latest studies that look for bacteriophages in the human body, there is one, the latest estimate is that 30 billion bacteriophages traffic the human body on a daily basis. So uh, that, that's, this is straight up, just uh, send you the papers. I mean, so the viral ecosystems are, it's like we just started looking at a new universe. And so if you look at the last interview on my blog is with a, a researcher who's a great guy, David Padespino at the Joint Genome Institute. And that's what his team does. They simply develop technology that now looks for novel and unknown viruses in ecosystems all over Earth. They're running what's called the, um, 
uh, uncovering the Earth's virome project. So they look in oceans. Maybe you wouldn't even think there's, vi there's viruses on every single part of the planet. But when it comes to the human body, the current estimate is that we probably only sequenced or discovered maybe one to 2% of all the viruses that live in the human body. So when you think about that, um, I mean, the potential for infectious agents to contribute to mysterious conditions or con diseases of unknown cause or a lot of these rare, and David actually says that in the interview, there are a lot of rare diseases now, mysterious diseases, inflammatory diseases. At that same time, there's an explosion of research showing that there are vastly more microbes in the human body than we ever thought, you know, one to 2% of viruses in the body that we've just be begun to, you know, we have 99% have yet to be studied. So that really means that, that, that these microbial ecosystems in our body could have be having a tremendous effect on, on a, a huge number of conditions. Mm. And so just um, to make, sort of tie back in what you were talking about earlier with the gut microbiome and Crohn's and inflammation, um, you know, I had a previous uh, guest on the show and we were talking about intestinal permeability and how that can mm -hmm. also be a key driver for autoimmunity conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering here, do you think then that it would say be the gut microbiome that would cause a, dis a dysfunction in the, in the gut permeability to, to make it so that it could stimulate this process of autoimmunity? I'm wondering here. I think that's certainly part of it. I think that gut microbes um, probably, uh, first I'll just say this, I, I would say the human body is more connected than we have assumed. That's a, another thing. I don't necessarily think that um, more current research suggests that microbes can probably move more easily in and out of the gut than we thought probably more easily in and easily in and out of the brain than we thought. Um, for example, there's a whole new central nervous lymphatic system that's just been discovered that connects the brain to the body that we didn't know existed before. So more pathways in which microbes and immune cells can actually traffic the body without being so compartmentalized. So what that means to me is microbes in the gut, whether the, the, the gut lining is, you know, weakened or leaky or not, can probably, uh, yes, get into the blood a decent amount of cases. And for example, there's one study um, done by Gary Sudzak's group at Scripps that looked at metabolites in human blood, and 90% of the metabolites were actually derived from the gut microbiome. So these are, these are metabolites, but they were, number one, microbial metabolites, and they were also, they seem to be derived from bacteria in the gut. So there seems to be a definite connection between the microbes in your gut and the metabolites that they express and create and proteins and what ends up in the blood. That being said, though, I wouldn't ignore um, the contribution. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in not just focusing on that. I do think we also need to think about the fact that is in modern society, we um, are exposed to many more pathogens than, than we have, than most people have in previous years so, or previous times. So think about an international airport, for example. When you go to an international airport, <laughs> there's, I mean, I don't, like you get on a flight and there can be people who have, you know, harbor any kinds of pathogens, right, from, from every country in the world. And that's opposed to not that long ago when people mostly lived in the same town and were exposed to the same, you know, same microbes um, most of the time. The same thing happens with our food. There are microbes in all the food that we eat, whether it's fruits, vegetables, meat, right? So back not that long ago, most people probably ate locally. So they were kind of used to the microbes they would ingest in food. But now if you go to the supermarket, one day the banana you buy is from Ecuador, one day it's from Mexico. So we are exposing ourselves to lots of new microbes, but there's a lot of pathogens in those, uh, in those places and communities too. So I don't want to underemphasize the fact that a pathogen, pathogen that doesn't have to get in through the gut, that could simply infect human uh, blood cells in the blood and also circulate through the body, those can be some of the biggest players. Because for example, um, take a condition like HIV AIDS, right? So that's a clear, it's one of the most clear cases in which we know there's a, a serious pathogen that infects, in, uh, infects into the blood usually, right? A bloodborne pathogen and has a tremendous, it, it'll survive inside the cells of the immune system where it, it, it has a huge impact on the host immune system. It will just drop the host immune it, HIV controls um, the immune system in a way that almost makes it not function, not function anymore. The patients become incredibly immunocompromised. What you'll see in HIV AIDS, and there was a study I just read last week, 
was that this team was smart. They looked at not only HIV in the blood, but they looked at the gut microbiome and the virome in those patients. And of course, the gut microbiome was totally uh, dysbiotic, imbalanced, less diversity, less richness. The virome also had a lot of you know, viruses you wouldn't really expect to see activated, adenoviruses. And that is probably because the immune system is so down in these patients that any pathogen in these other microbe communities is like, wow, what a great, you know, what a field day for me. There's no immune system anymore. I'm going to act up too. So the end symptoms that any person with HIV AIDS ends up having are a mix of those driven by HIV in the blood, what it does to the immune system, and then total flow on effects on how the microbiome environment, other parts of the body begins to also move towards imbalance because the immune system is basically out of the out of the picture, right? So that might be happening in other conditions too. We we don't want to ignore the possibility that when we see gut microbiome uh, problems, that there could also be pathogens in tissue and blood that may be affecting the immune system or the body in ways that promote that or you know feed into that imbalance. And again, the end disease is going to be a mix of all of that. Let's say there's even pathogens in the blood. Well. Even when the gut, even if that causes the gut microbiome to more easily move away from a state of imbalance, that's ser- that that feeds back in, right? So it's, all of it's going to feed into each other. And at a certain point, you say, "Where do we intervene?" And at this point, you pretty much have to say, "Yeah, the gut microbiome." So I still get that because the gut is where we can ingest things, change our diet, add things in. Um, the the rest of the body is a bit harder at this point in time, except for, like I said, in, in my opinion, therapies that could just help stimulate the immune system itself. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, so I still agree with, I probably would agree with your person who would, uh, that last, you know, researcher or whoever who would say that focusing on the gut and, you know, ability of microbes to move in and out of blood, that, that is a big topic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, typically in, in healthcare, um, the, the gut is trying to become more the, like a primary um, so way of trying to treat someone for a, a cascade of you know a variety of of conditions yeah. it's like it's your diet it's what you're eating mm-hmm. you're ingesting mm-hmm. exactly. the supplements you take so mm-hmm. it's kind of like you have this problem somewhere in your body but let's eat right. something and it will go there exactly. and fix that so that's the way you would pretty much want to start is that you know you could try to tweak you know, there are patients that I know that have these conditions and they've done treatments like the one that I published two papers on that tried to activate the immune system or something like that. In addition, though, they always include a diet component, a, you know, a, an attempted probiotic component, a fermented foods component. Uh, because, yeah, it, like we're saying, a, a, a huge trillions of microbes persist in the gut. And no matter what, if the body starts moving towards a state of imbalance, those microbes will go along with that. So coming back and trying to improve that community it might, like we say, have flow. We need to, we need to come in. I mean, like you would say, we need to hack in somewhere. Right. And so at this point in time, hacking into the gut is probably the most, what we can actionably do right now in 2018 in a way that could result in, in an outcome. Right. Mm -hmm. I hope that changes. I hope there's even more ways to address pathogens and, and dysbiosis and other parts of the body. But right now the gut is pretty much central. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's the easiest point of access with, I guess, the least amount of Risky and side effects. No small thing. I mean, diet. You know, you you feed your microbes in addition to you. So, diet is to me. I mean, that's what you keep in mind is whatever you eat is going to get metabolized by your microbes in addition to your body. So, if you think about it, you know, that's that's one way, a consideration with diet. And I think this brings me to a question too, where, um, you know, you got to love the human race. We have a multitude of diets too, and people can have. A multitude of reactions so you'll have someone who's on one particular diet who right. does amazing another person doesn't so they switch to this diet and this yeah. person does well here and this one doesn't and everyone's always trying to find the answer so how come these people seem to do so well but i didn't do so well and these people do so well and i didn't do so well so it becomes ever ending oh no it doesn't seem to be a one-all fit but in right. this case here i guess we could use the the concepts that you're introducing today about the microbiome and this diversity that that could mm-hmm. explain that in your particular situ- situation, your microbiome actually seemed to become more diverse and better balanced when you ate this certain way. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm wondering. I'm wondering if that's maybe a part of the discussion there. Yeah. I think about that all the time, and that's why I'm hesitant to recommend any kind of diet because I have uh, I know patients who've improved on a ketogenic diet, and I know patients who've improved on a vegan diet. So I can't. I don't know what I recommend specifically. 
But what I've noticed as a general trend with these diets that interest me is that almost when, this is what I notice when most people decide to take action and uh, change their diet in a way that they can impact, things can impact their health, they do a number of things. They begin to look better at the quality of the ingredients that they get. So I see these general trend, trends. They'll look, they'll, whether they're eating meat in any kind of diet, they tend to, now they're eating, they look for meat without antibiotics, without hormones added. They're looking at what kind of eggs they're buying. You know, uh, we're trying to get, you know, cage-free eggs or eggs that haven't been, you know, completely hormoned into who knows what. Um, then they begin to buy vegetables often sometimes from a local farmer's market. Same thing with meat. A lot of times they'll get a local butcher or someone. And so one of the trends that I see that I think um, might be part of why when people change their diet, things improve is simply because they improve the quality of the ingredients they're eating, um, where they're getting the ingredients from. And you know they, they're paying way more attention to the nature of the food they get. So yeah, for example, um, I eat in a way I kind of, I still eat a diverse amount of food, but I try to get it from farmer's markets where I know how it's grown, where I kind of, they tell me what pesticides are being used and this and whatnot, right? And so I see that, you know, a lot of people, when they go on a vegan diet, they start doing that. And so do people on a Mediterranean diet. And so we may also be looking at cases in which foods that are less treated with pesticides, that are less treated with chemicals, that have less antibiotics in them, that have less hormones in them, that are more natural, that are more you know, tied to being grown and, and raised in the way that they probably should be, um, are being eaten by people. And I think that's a big consideration also, just the nature of the food itself. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts then on doing stool testing when it, people now can do tests to see their um, microbial diversity? Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of the commercial tests that are available out there. Do you think? Do you think those tests are worthwhile, or does it just lead to confusion? Because what what truly is a balanced um, yeah. microbial microbial biome? Exactly. I don't, and I think it depends also on on your budget. Um, it wouldn't be a priority for me, put it that way. Depending on what I had to spend money on, um, we know very little about the microbiome when it comes down to it. We, we know there's a lot of trends that we still, we're just, we're on the kind of the cusp of beginning to explore it, to be honest. So like you're saying, we don't necessarily know that more of X bacteria is necessarily good for you or this or that, right? So it is sometimes hard. I, I definitely, I got my gut microbiome sequence one through human gut project or it's, um, Rob Knight's team led this, and it was just a way of them uh, gathering more data on the gut microbiome, which I thought was cool. But yeah, when I get my results back, there's nothing I could really do based off that because I didn't know yet. Uh, we don't really know yet what a lot of those species are doing or how they're acting. So I think you could look for general trends. You might, if you see a lack of diversity or something like that. But I, I don't do regular testing because of the fact that yeah, I don't think we know enough to be able to interpret those tests yet in a way that's totally actionable. And also the other thing about the gut microbiome is that a lot of things affect composition of the gut microbiome. So time of day affects composition of the gut microbiome. What you just ate will affect composition. Your location will affect composition of the gut microbiome. There's even a, I think a study, I mean, whether or not women are uh, like menses or your period can affect your gut. So there are so many variables that affect composition of the gut microbiome that it's very hard to isolate those that are driven by disease induced factors. And so you might end up getting a little too confused by the noise at this point and wondering, you know, what is from this or that, right? So I don't, necessarily, I don't see it as a, as a bad thing. I just don't know that that would, that's my primary focus, for example, in my own health. Yeah, it's kind of like doing 23andMe DNA sequencing and you're getting bucket loads of data yeah, and you but, kind of wonder, okay, but what do I do? I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I, and even with those 23andMe, the, 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 the studies that they're using to, to find those gene associations, those are just a few studies with not that, sometimes not that big a sample size. So, you, I mean, the, where the info is coming on whether that a gene – um, that you have may or may not influence a particular condition, that's still coming from very early research too. So there's a, th these are good ideas. I just think we still need to work on perfecting them in ways that are, lead to more solid conclusions and conclusions we can really be more uh, sure about running on. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, um, when it comes to the gut microbiome and a lot of things, I, I just go more off symptoms. I know that um, you know, seems simple, 
But if I uh, try a probiotic, I really will try to just uh, chart how I feel when I take that probiotic and better, you know, understand how my symptoms might be affected rather than necessarily doing an analysis of the gut microbiome at this point. Yeah. And, so, and so do you, you do believe that probiotics will create an influence on the gut? I mean, I think so. I, yeah, it depends. Again, I don't recommend any specific I well I've had people improve symptoms with VSL3 that's one that I know um but their probiotics is difficult you have to research what you take I know they're that much there are certain brands where the probiotic might not be alive um the probiotic species might not so I I don't and I'm I'm not totally up to date on exactly what brands there there's some people who are better up to date on that like they these seem to stay alive better these these, these you know they have to survive for example the mm. acid in the stomach so we don't you don't want to spend a lot of money on probiotics only to you know find or I don't know how to find out only that the fact that they get there and they're dead right I mean that, that's that could be happening so if you do do probiotics you want to think yeah uh, you have to do your background research to make sure that what you're taking seems to be a really well made live you know probiotic that other people you know have also found to be helpful so I think it's a definitely interesting uh, area of uh, exploration, but you have to be careful with what brands you're doing and using and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, Amy, I know we've already been speaking for about an hour and we could go on for more hours at the moment. As you said, this just opens up a whole other chapter of things to, to yeah. go down and explore, which, yeah, I'm finding fascinating. I mean, it's the, the knowledge that you've shared today, I think is going to be novel to a lot of people i mean it's it's so novel to myself to a lot of these concepts and i just mm -hmm. want to say thank you for doing that um because it's it's definitely going to get a lot of people thinking about what they can start doing or maybe other factors why they might be stagnant on a certain treatment it's going, oh, maybe i should look at this microbiome and see what, how it could stimulate my own immune system to try ha yeah. help me out here so i just want to say thank you so much for that um if anyone wants to keep up to date with you or follow you online do you have any particular resources that you'd like to share at this point yes i have uh my blog is microbeminded.com and i try as much as i can to at least put important studies and findings on there and i've done a couple i'm going to keep trying to do a couple short kind of podcasts where i narrate some of the things i write to try to get you know make it easier for people to follow and listen and i'm experimenting with experimenting with doing some videos myself actually to explain some concepts in addition to that that my blog has a link to my research papers which are more complicated versions of what i'm talking about but i mean there's a decent number of people who follow those papers and those are um you know those really embody what i'm talking about and then um i also um, i'm pretty active on twitter these days my handle is microbe too and i think twitter is an awesome place for science communication at the moment uh, every day there are studies that um are you know new studies on these topics that play into this and it's a great way so uh a lot of times i'll share some of those studies and comment on them on twitter so that's a good way to keep up with what i'm going to yeah yeah well, and then hopefully um on my blog if i end up speaking somewhere whatever i put it there too so. cool well i'll put all of those links in the show notes for all the listeners and uh, i definitely would recommend twitter i follow a lot of doctors and researchers yeah, right? on twitter because it's it's a highly communicative um community Sweet. on there so uh and you're one of those that i like to follow too Cool. Yeah, no, I agree. It's really cool. So yeah. All right, good. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. All right, cool. We'll be in touch. Thanks.